my career, I want to take you on a little story and I'm going to share uh, my PowerPoint with me. Uh, here we go. Hopefully that you'll see that pop up in front of you. And um, let's, let's go. So um, at 16, um, excuse the embarrassing photos there. I don't look like that anymore. Um, but uh, when I was 16, I joined the Royal Navy. Um, I left school with no qualifications and, um, and I had to make a, <clears throat> an important decision around when I was 15. I lived with my grandparents and I had an idyllic life. Um, so my grandparents were farmers. Um, we, we grew fruit and vegetables and, um, and it was that kind of you know, very or organic uh, childhood. Um, but I wasn't very clever at school. You know, I, I got by, I didn't have any, any qualifications. So joining the Royal Navy was a natural step. Um, and to join the Royal Navy, um, I had to take exams and I kind of failed those um, and I became a sonar operator. So there's a warship in the bottom right hand corner, HMS Hermione. And I proudly visited India at Goa on that ship. It was a really, it was a wonderful experience. Best, the best um, uh, city I've ever been to in my life. It was, it was amazing. Um, and um, as a sonar operator, um, you listen out uh, for enemy submarines and, and, and the Royal Navy trained me. So, and this is, the, this is my point. So the training is so intense that you train, 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 you know, almost 24 hours of the day. You, you are the best at your job that you can possibly ever be. But life at sea was very diverse. When I joined the Royal Navy, I left uh, a farming background and then joined a community. You can see there, you know, um, 30 to 50 men in a very small environment. Um, from all walks of life. And in fact, at that time, there were people um, who were being diverted from prison. So people who had been convicted of crimes would go to court and the court would suggest you can join the armed forces or you can go to prison. And obviously a lot of people join the armed forces. Um, so it was a big eye opener for me. I was, I'm quite small. I'm, I'm um, quite friendly. So I managed to get on with an awful lot of people and I used to navigate the, the, the harsher side of life at sea. And then I, then I, I went to the Gulf War and became a, a clearance diver. Um, and this is where, this is, this is very relevant to, to, to the rest of my career and my transition in thinking. So um, I joined the Royal Navy, became a sonar operator, and then became a Royal Navy diver. Now, a Royal Navy diver is something, you know, is something quite special. It's a unique role. Um, we dived in all conditions uh, at any time of day or night, freezing cold, you know, uh, Icelandic waters for unexploded World, World War II ordnance mainly. Um, and um, I'm not sure if you know, but there are still hundreds of thousands of tons from uh, both World Wars um, surrounding the English Isles and, and throughout the Mediterranean um, and, 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 and further afield. So there's lots of unexploded ordnance um, um, uh, you know, still lying on the bottom and fishing boats draw, uh, trawl them up all of the time. And our job is to dive down um, and explode them, just safely dispose of them. And during the Gulf War, um, during the, 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 the Straits uh, in the Gulf, um, Saddam Hussein uh, uh, um, released hundreds of these mines, as you can see, and our job was to swim. But clearly the point of this is not to, not to make me look anything special at all, it's to actually show you the amount of training. We were an elite team with our training was so 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 intense that um, that's all we did you know we were we were arguably the best in the world at our job um, so I then joined the police and um, and this took me on a, a, a new journey so I came out of the police um, sorry the, the Royal Navy highly trained but highly capable I was a, a very young 23 year old but I was the second oldest in, in our intake. And I joined the Metropolitan Police of, uh, in London. And, um, and I very quickly, after my basic training, uh, understood that drugs were going to be a complete feature in every single thing I did. Um, and every day I went to work, there would be something drug related. So um, I was based in Kingston. And Kingston was home to uh, the biggest drug uh, treatment and rehab centre in the southeast of England. Um, and Kingston is in the southwest corner of London. And, um, and I, I was a very capable, highly trained individual. I learned the law and I applied it robustly, robotically. 
And I would hit the streets of Kingston. I would be arresting three or four people every single day. And I had a keen eye for people using drugs. And I thought, um, shamefully now, actually, on reflection, but I thought people use drugs for fun, for enjoyment. For um, I thought that that young woman sitting in a hedge, injecting heroin into her arm, was all about fun. I thought, how dare you get high? I'm arresting you, you know, instantly. And, and, and I, I became uh, like this chap here, Robocop. Everybody must, must remember that, that film. You have three seconds to comply. And I was literally that robotic. I was, um, if I saw an offence in front of me, I'd be arresting someone. And I didn't consider the consequences of arresting people. I didn't consider at all the impact that I had as a police officer on someone's life. I thought I was doing the, the good. I thought that I was just um, applying the law and, um, and, and I applied it um, uh, vigorously. I, I really did. Um, and then I took a bit of time to get to know and like. I became, I became um, quite friendly, in fact, with some drug users around uh, the Clydescope. Um, and there were hundreds of people that would come to the Clydescope in the morning for their drug treatment. So I would see people in suits, teachers, lawyers, police officers, bus drivers, you know, everybody from every walk of life used to come in for some form of drug treatment. And that puzzled me because really I, I had, I thought it was all about um, people who lived rough on the streets and slept, um, you know, homeless or, or were sex working. Um, I, I, I couldn't get my head around the kind of stigmatizing aspect of, of two different or, or, or four corners of society um, all using the same drug. Um, I got to know uh, a chap called Lee, and Lee was a very funny young man. He, he used to make me laugh, even though I'd be arresting him at the time, he would make a joke of it. And we used to laugh together like anything. And I quite liked him. I, I, I felt quite bad for arresting him on occasions. Um, and, but I looked forward to meeting him, and he was always in the same place, doing the same thing. Um, and he lived with his partner, um, who was pregnant, um, and they lived rough, rough on the street. And um, I, came with, I came to work one day and, um, and I heard that Lee had been murdered. And that, that really shocked me. And then when I understood more about circumstances of his, of his murder, um, I found that he was stabbed in the leg, in, at which caught his femoral artery and he bled to death. Um, and he owed £120 for a drug debt. That was why he was murdered, for 120 quid. His life was worth a very small amount of money. And that really did impact me. I thought, what a waste of a life. He was the funniest man I've ever met. And I thought, and then I thought, what about his, his partner? She's pregnant. That, that child is now going to be um, uh, without a father for all of, all of their life. And, and that really did impact me. And I had a moment where I, was, I began to consider, actually, these drug users, people who use drugs as real human beings. So uh, a friend of mine, Martin Blakebrook, uh, who was the manager and, and CEO of um, the Kaleidoscope, uh, took time to get me in and understand addiction. He, he, went, he invested heavily into you know, what was addiction, what, what does it really mean? And um, he took a, a lot of time to, for me to understand. At first, I didn't want to go into the cafe um, at the Kaleidoscope and drink tea because I thought it was dirty. I had a stigma about drugs and, and drug use. And then I began to realise and see different things. I began to see corruption. I began to see my colleagues, police officers, also using drugs after work, cannabis, for instance. Um, and then, uh, but I didn't like it. I, I, I informed uh, my uh, supervisors about what was going on, which was difficult as well. Um, and, um, and my colleagues were arrested. And I thought, I don't want to be part of this environment. So I moved to Thames Valley Police. Um, and you can see some pictures there on, on your right. Um, you may remember, you may recognise a couple of them. Um, Theresa May, um, the former Prime Minister, um, and, um, and, I, and I'll lead on to the story relating to her in a quick second. Um, Lord Brian Paddock, he was a former police officer and championed a different approach uh, to uh, young people possessing drugs. Um, and uh, uh, Diane Abbott, in, in the bottom, bottom left-hand corner, um, she um, uh, was an MP for the Labour Party, and again, was really inspired about uh, drug diversion. And everybody recognises probably the door on the bottom right. Um, and, and that is linked to Theresa May, which I'll, I'll tell you about very shortly. Um, 
But I had a great experience in the Thames Valley. It was brilliant. You know, policing big royal events, um, you know, the Queen, um, and a quick funny story about the Queen. Um, I, I, I remember her well because um, one day she ran over my foot um, and it was the most painful experience. But um, the thing is, who do you tell? Who can you actually tell that the Queen ran over your foot? Um, so anyway, she got away with that. And, um, but drugs, again, were, were consistent. And, but I was fascinated with the drug using community. So I became an undercover police officer. I was trained to buy drugs uh, on behalf of the police and, and live on the street. So I lived on cardboard. I lived um, within vulnerable communities to protect them. And I, I, I really enjoyed that, that part of the work. Um, but I thought differently. I, the, the seed in my brain began to change from Robocop into a different, into a different person. Now, policing. What is the role of the police? Traditionally, I'm going to draw your attention to the bottom paragraph. Police are typically responsible for maintaining public order safety and enforcing the law and preventing. But what about vulnerability? The police, there are hundreds of thousands of police officers across the world. You could say we're the biggest outreach team in the world. Yet policing is not the same everywhere, is it? And that's and we have a very important role if done correctly. The police can cause massive harm. We can cause huge harm to communities. Yet we can also cause significant harm reduction. We can, we can really reduce vulnerability if we're careful, if we work with our communities. Um, this is an infographic uh, completed uh, or produced by the National Police Chiefs Council in 2018-19. Forgive it, it's, it's a few years old now, but it's still very relevant. I just want to draw your attention to what the drug issue is in, in the UK, um, but also the cost. So the, the monetary cost, the you know, treatment, enforcement, but look at that in itself. More is spent on enforcement than treatment. Shouldn't that be the other way around? I, I'd argue it should be. Look at the amount of money on hospitalizations. Look at the amount of money um, uh, uh, attributed to drug-related crime. But where is the real cost? The real cost here is drug-related deaths. The real cost actually is convictions. If you look at the bottom of the infographic, uh, convictions of young people aged between 10 and 17 for class A drugs, that's heroin, crack, um, with intent to supply is increased by 69% between in this six year period. That's huge. That's a huge number of young people in prison for supplying drugs, which is essentially a commodity controlled by adults. That just isn't right. So we need to do something about that. We need to reduce supply um, and reduce demand. But how do police do that? And there's one surefire way, and that's education and awareness instead of arrest. So what is diversion? Diversion is basically recognising the evidence for many, particularly young people. The police is actually doing nothing. is far more effective than an arrest, than doing something, something which is harmful. Having the lightest touch from police has a far greater impact on a young person's life. Uh, and this evidence here from the Edinburgh study uh, quoted by Professor Alex Stevens. Interventions by the community, community drug and alcohol services, way before the police are involved, even if police find someone in possession of a controlled drug, can have a greater impact on that person's life. Um, so what's happening in the UK? Well, actually, we've, we've redesigned that infographic from the National Police Chiefs Council, and actually the true cost is record numbers of drug-related deaths. The UK has... Um, record, number, num record numbers of drug-related deaths for the past nine years. Um, stigma. We really stigmatise drug users. The police have this ability to penalise, to add, add a punitive element to, um, to, to, to drugs and, and drug policy and arrests. We can't actually arrest our way out of these drug-related deaths. The police can't arrest everybody in possession of a drug. And in fact, the huge numbers of people who do use drugs worldwide, the threat of arrest doesn't work anyway. So actually the law's ineffective um, and we need to look at a different way. So in the UK, we are moving towards diversion and diversion 
is, 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 is based upon the lowest legal outcome available to us. So that means we can use the community resolution. A community resolution basically negates the need for an arrest. We don't have to interview and we don't even require that person to admit their guilt. It's about actually a police officer um, finding someone in possession of a drug and then passing it over to the drug treatment or drug recovery or the young person's services as quickly as possible on the same day or the day after. That's really, really key. And this reduces disproportionality, racial disproportionality. It builds a stronger uh, public trust and confidence. The, the, the police in the UK is at a crisis point of trust, public trust. We are being scrutinised more and more and more. And we need to help the police navigate their way out of this situation. We need to rebuild trust. The police are the community and the community are the police. The policing by consent will only work if you have the community involved. Um, and one way to do that is through diversion. Um, and also schools. So we have um, 20,000 young people excluded from school each and every year for possessing, possessing drugs uh, in the UK alone. If you think about that worldwide, that's a huge number of young people being kicked out of school for possessing a drug. Actually, they don't need punishment. They need education and awareness. So policing in the UK now is moving towards actually giving these schemes, lending the model to this education sector so that the school can use diversion too. And you might think, there'll be someone somewhere thinking, well, this is too relaxed. This is too soft. This is too, um, you know, it's voluntary. What if someone doesn't attend? Well, in these four police forces, they have academic evaluations that prove that young people, and in fact, up to 96% of young people complete a six week course. Um, and over half of those people want to stay on beyond the number of sessions uh, open to them. And it's not just drugs, it's about sexual health. It's about harm reduction. It's about helping a young person navigate their way out of the gang. It's about mental health. It's about all of those things that you heard actually in the previous um, presentation. It's about actually people coming together to really uh, improve that young person's life. And what it looks like in practice here, you don't need, there won't be any tests at the end of this. There's a lot of words here, but essentially a police officer finds someone in possession of a, a drug. Um, and the police officer says, now, no, you don't have to say you're under arrest. You're coming back with me. What we do now, actually, I'll tell you a story. A young 14 year old ran off from police officers. He was chased. He was caught, found with cannabis, and he um, was taken home. They were sat down on, 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 on his um, parents' um, uh, kitchen table, and, um, and the police officer said, we're not going to take any formal action here, which surprised the parents. We're not going to arrest your son. We're going to offer education and awareness. Will you take part in that scheme? And yes, he did governance and everything else the police are still aware of the situation of course but oh handing it over immediately to the drug service the drug service then contact that individual on the same day or the day after and then that's it hand over to the young person um, drug service who are the professionals uh, uh, and then three it, this young person was three weeks into the into the sessions and then he admitted that he was using uh, mdma uh, an LSD in a risky way and obviously that was the highlight he was using more harmful drugs with a bigger group of people the drug service were able to say we're not part of the police bring your friends in bring your friends in and they can receive education as well and that's what it's about um, I'm very near the end and I want to move away from uh, in fact I want to go back to uh, this slide here with Theresa May um, so um, when I was developing the concept of diversion. Um, I spoke with uh, Theresa May as it followed a drug-related death of a young woman. The young woman um, injected heroin and fentanyl uh, uh, and died from an overdose. And um, her parents asked the MP, uh, which happened to be Theresa May, um, about the death, to inquire about the death. Theresa May is from the Conservative Party and the Conservative Party have a robust a politically robust attitude towards drugs. 
the, the, the response to drugs has to be tough, has to be, you know, robust. Um, what I'm proposing was anything but that. Was It was uh, trauma-informed, it was educational, um, yet she had to acknowledge what I was saying was evidence. She opened the door to number 10 for me to present the model. Despite the political red lines, despite the political difficulties of, 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 um, of you know, changing drug policy. Now, politicians talk tough, but actually police, health, academia can really open the door. And you can see there, she didn't look too happy when I first um, told her about the scheme, but in the end, she, um, she was a huge advocate of, 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 of uh, harm, redu harm reduction, but trauma um, evidence-based uh, drug policy uh, around diversion. And I have to thank her for that. Um, so just to finish, enhanced harm reduction. This photograph here, this is only uh, two minutes long, so I know I'm just uh, going over slightly. Um, this is uh, Vespro. This is dr a drug consumption room in uh, Copenhagen in Denmark. I took this photograph from the uh, police HQ car park, Copen Copenhagen Police HQ, um, and Vespro is the building in the foreground with the lights on. Um, and that treats 8,000 uh, people uh, every single month, I believe, uh, for injecting heroin. So and I'll tell you what it does. So the, the young, he wasn't young actually, he was in his 40s. Um, this man on the right, um, he was from Sweden. Now, Sweden has a, has a robust drug policy um, and Denmark has a more um, health-based approach. So he saw the opportunity to seek drug treatment in, in Denmark and walked 60 miles to this centre. He appeared at the door. He had a, a wrap of heroin um, and uh, he, was, he, he was met by the nurse and the nurse tested the heroin there and then to make sure it was uh, uh, not dangerous or, or contaminated. And um, the, the man then was given uh, clean needles, um, harm reduction, um, and also the nurse was able to um, assess his body. Where, you know, he, he, she said, where are you going to inject? Um, and he pointed to his groin and she said, no, 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 don't inject there. There's a big abscess, a wound. Um, and she scanned for a safer vein for him to inject into. He was left alone for 20 minutes. And, and I'm just going to leave this here. Within 20 minutes... The whole system gathered around. The whole, every, every, every professional from every discipline was able to help that person. So a hairdresser, a chiropodist to look after his feet, um, clothing, food, um, shelter, uh, wound care, and bloodborne virus screening. But more importantly, empathy, care and compassion and empathy harm reduction and i asked the police officers in the in the car park what do you think of this what do you think that of eight thousand people injecting in this environment every single month and they said it's the best thing that's ever happened to the city and i said why and they said because there's no more dead people lying in the street so when i go back to politics and tough when we launched drug diversion um in the uk the papers, uh, some papers, some newspapers were going. Thames Valley Police go soft on um, go um, soft on drugs, and I said, I was allowed to reply, and I said, there's nothing soft about preventing death, and that, and that's absolutely true. Um, so for me, um, thank you for listening. Um, sorry for running slightly over. I will just um, uh, leave some contact details there on the screen. And please, uh, I can answer any questions uh, as uh, as needed. So I'll stop sharing there and take any questions if we're able to do that. Thank you.